Oh, Sarah Bear, I can't believe it's the last show of the season. We have had so much fun. Yes, it has, hasn't it? And I mean, today we're going to the most amazing place yet. We're going back in time, back to the 1970s. <laughs> Remember then, Kate? Barely. I mean, I divide my life into two stages, BC and AC, before champagne and after champagne. <laughs> yeah, well, I can imagine how the decade in which cask wine was, you know, basically became a household beverage might have slipped your mind. Let's just call it the dark ages. <laughs> yes, well, today we're coming out of the dark and into the light because we are interviewing one of Australia's hottest literary couples. Deborah Oswald, of course, is the creative genius behind the fabulously successful television series Offspring. And her husband, Rich Glover, is, of course, the hilariously funny and brilliant ABC radio host and journalist. Yes, well, both have set their books in the 1970s, which should at least make the menu planning easy. <laughs> I have to admit, the food in the 1970s was notoriously awful. Oh, so awful. I guess we'll just have to serve up an oxymoron then. <laughs> a delicious 1970s feast. I have to say, it's so interesting though. You know, we started this season with a husband and wife author team, and now we're finishing the season with another husband and wife author team. Bookends! <laughs> Jeans! <laughs> I do have to say, I, I have one very strong memory of the 1970s there, and that is um, coming down here to the rocks. My sister and I were dressed in matching, groovy jumpsuits, and we came to see the Queen open up the new Opera House. I remember basically the student protests in ending Vietnam and also, I mean, you know, in this magnificent area of the rocks, Jack Mundy and the Union stopped them from tearing down the whole historic area, which would have just been a tragedy. Can you imagine anyone would want to tear down this amazing place, all these beautiful historic buildings? And of course, the other great thing that I remember about the 70s is that tertiary education was free for all and free health care. Um, it was, it was an era that changed the face of Australia. I cannot wait to hear what Richard and Deborah have to say about this fascinating decade. I think it'll be hilarious. I don't think we should serve them any cask wine though. No, we have so much to celebrate in champagne all the way. Yes, I love this job. Deborah Oswald has written a book called The Whole by Ear. It's a retelling of the Persephone and Demeter myth but set in 1976 on a peach farm in New South Wales. This is a book about love in all its different forms, but in particular, the love between a mother and a daughter. It's so beautiful, it's heart-rending. I absolutely love this book. And our second book is by Richard Glover, and basically it's uh, part journalism, part autobiography, and it takes the reader on a wild tour of the food, times, customs and cars of the 1970s. So um, I have planned the most delicious feast for us, which I have to admit was hard since we're going back to the 1970s and the food wasn't fantastic then. But, you know, um, I think I've come up with a really nice, um, nice menu. We're starting with prawn and avocado cocktail salad. And then we're going to have a steak Diane, which was served in all the fancy fancy restaurants in the 70s followed by an iconic Australian um, dessert called Peach Melba. So, let's get the prawn cocktails happening. Do you want to um, help me peel the prawn, Sarah? Oh, I, I don't want to get prawn juice all over the book. So, like, it's okay, you can do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> no worries. going to slice up some fennel to add some extra crunch and flavour to my little salad. Fennel wasn't that 1970s, was it? No, not at all. But then, you know, this isn't an authentic 1970s meal. This is a 70s inspired feast. Mm -hmm. I'm allowed to use fennel, I think. <laughs> yes, well, you know, just as well we're not going the whole vlog with the 70s. I think um, Richard's... Um, had a full 1970s dinner party. I was just reading here in the book and I, I'll read you the quote. <laughs> uh, it's hilarious. Um, 
His guest said, I've never been to a dinner party where you were allowed to be so enormously rude about the food. <laughs> well, I hope that Richard and Deborah don't think that about our meal. So I'm gonna make the seafood sauce now. Do you wanna give me a hand? It's just so funny. Just let me read one more little bit. I just, this is just okay. so funny. Okay. Well, I am making uh, a seafood sauce, which is my mother's time-honored recipe. And we actually make this every Christmas day. And um, so I, I have made this time, this more times than I can count. So I put the cream in, which I've just spilt everywhere. Put in some tomato sauce. So we just mix the tomato sauce into the cream with the lemon juice and then add a slurp of Worcester sauce. And that is it. Mm, delicious. A little bit of salt and pepper in there and that'll be perfect. So I'm going to be cooking the steak, Diane, just before we eat it. But I'm going to get everything ready now. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a herb butter. Because I'll use this herb butter to cook all our ingredients. Our vegetables, our potatoes and our meat. And this gives it a really strong base to tie the meal together. is the easiest thing in the world to make. I make it all the time, um, just with herbs out of my garden. You can make it with parsley, you can make it with sage, you can make it with thyme, whatever you like. But today, I'm actually going to make it with some thyme because a steak Diane is quite a um, rich dish and we don't want too strong uh, taste overpowering everything. to do is to make the pudding which I have decided to do a variation on a famous Australian dish called the peach melba. Peaches of course for the whole bright year. Deborah's book. This dish was invented in 1893 by the French chef Auguste Escoffier and purists say that you should never meddle with a master's recipe but I say that recipes are made to be changed. Robert Louis Stevenson always said, I can never tell a story without giving it a new hat and a new stick. And I'm the same with recipes and with stories as well. So the new hat and stick that I'm giving the peach melba today is I'm gonna make it into an eaten mess. And that basically means quite a lot of fun throwing it all together. So, Sarah, do you wanna give me a hand? Okay, you know work's not my thing. <laughs> <laughs> Here, look, look, I do this so well, so just let me read you one quote from Deborah's The Whole Bright Year. It's a beautiful quote. Um, yeah, her book basically is about the fragility of life and the powerlessness of the human condition, particularly when you're a parent. And, and this one just really tugged at my heartstrings. It says, some problems could be solved by throwing effort at them, but some necessary things, like letting your child go out into the world, the beautiful, perilous world, required you to just sit with things gnawing in your belly and learn not to do anything. I mean, it's so true, isn't it? Well, it's certainly true of you today, darling. <laughs> <laughs> so, to make an eaten mess, the best fun part is you actually put your little meringues into a bag like this, and then you pound it to death. A good way to get out your anger and aggression. Not that I ever have any, of course. You're doing a wonderful job, Kate. Thank you, darling. Any time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>
now is make a simple sugar syrup. It's just simply caster sugar. You would normally do it with, um, with water, but I like to use orange blossom water because it smells so good. We just mix those together. So the last thing I have to do, oh, almost there, is I just have to whip the cream. And then we just put all this deliciousness together and we have a pitch mova eaten mess. So, just pour the cream in. Sebe, I could really do with some help now, you know. Well, look, I suppose I could just lend a bit of a hand. Just, just <laughs> hold on one second. I'm throwing oh. it everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. the best, it's the best part of making pudding. <laughs> I love this job. <laughs> I've got the good gear here. I've got the, the, the passion pop. Passion pop? Which was the big Let drink. the party happen! Yeah, nice. If we're going to go back in time to the 1970s, we need the right beverage. Here we go. Oh, oh that's how and look it's at done. That. Look at that. The taste of the 70s. Quick call the ambulance. Oh. <laughs> that is so disgusting. Passion pop. Passion, passion pop. pop. In the 70s. Oh. Mm. Mm, so Richard, I know that um, you started a newspaper of your own when you were in year six at school. Yes. With you That's know true. disastrous results. Mm. <laughs> Had you always wanted to be a writer? Had you always wanted to report? It's good writing, though, isn't it? It's good, mm. sort of this effort to capture the world, I think, and to mm. pin it wriggling. Um, against a board or something like that. I think that's the urge to write. My new book, the, the, it's called The Land Before Avocado, and it's really an anti-nostalgia book. It's not a nostalgia mm. book. In a way, it's a travel book. So I travel back to this time and really sort of immerse myself in the data and in the magazines and in the time. And there is some happy nostalgia in it, I suppose. But once you do that, you realise how terrible it was. How terrible it was in so many ways. You realise the homophobia and the sexism and the divorce laws and, uh, you know, I, I can't and really... the racism. The racism, oh, and, the racism. And, the, and then that gives you hope that we can change again, that the things we don't like now, we can change once yes. more. And yeah. we all are capable of imagining a better world and then working towards it. You know, this is one of the things I love the most about both of your books is this sense of power and optimism and the... The, you know, the fact that, you know, you can go through dark times, but if you are strong enough and if you are steadfast mm. enough, you can find the courage to, to keep on fighting. Human agency. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, yeah. Deborah's new book really is about, uh, you know, a child going out into the world and mm. how the mother feels about that. Yeah. Well, that's something that people have been thinking about no. for a long time. Yeah. Mm. Dem I, I love the way that it, yeah. it draws upon my favourite Greek myth, you know, Persephone and Demeter. Um, to me, the so many of the Greek myths about a journey into the underworld, yes, and then a journey back out into light and into life again. Mm. And I think, I mean, that was the thing I loved most about the whole bright year is this journey that um, you know both Celia and Zoe travelled on. They both travelled into the darkness. They both found unplumbed depths within them, and then they found somehow this. Uh, love of life and the strength to come back into the light again. I mean, you know, I was so choked up at the end of that book because I'm I, sorry, to, I'm, I'm so glad. It just sounds cruel, doesn't it? You know, confess that you love to I make love, people I cry. Do. I, I love, love to make people cry. My work on earth is done. Yeah. I, <laughs> no, do you know, do you know the thing? Do you know one of the things I, I love most is when somebody has read a character of mine that is initially difficult to like. Someone that you, we, we would all, there's a chance that we would judge if we met them in, in the world. Mm. And, and you sit with them long enough 
and, you, and, and you'd go through some trials and tribulations with them. And by the end, I've had pe- people say to me, I discovered I actually really cared about that character at the mm. end. Mm. Then we, you know, we actually talked I, about that, didn't I, we? Actually, this was another I one really, of my questions. That's, so that's, that's where I see it so perfect. Oh, okay. I just have to ask, sure. ask that question. You, you, were you using the irredeemable character as a literary device? Well, no, I think redeemable maybe is the wrong word. All people are, have a point of view. Nobody, very few people think of themselves as evil. Almost everybody can justify what they're doing. I always say so, that the antagonist is the protagonist of their own story. Hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. They think that's yeah. right. So, but what is interesting is how much easier plotting is if you've got someone evil. Yeah. And so, an audience loves a villain to hiss at. They do. That's so, something that's so, always important. So Nick to really is the most evil character. I mean, he's a very minor part of the book, but mm-hmm. he's the most evil character possibly I've ever written. And yeah. and I think I needed him because if the story is about this young woman going down into the Hades. underworld mm. and and sort of encountering death, which is part of the process of growing up, is is, is reconciling yourself mm. with the idea of death. I'm making the book sound so grim. No, it's, it's not grim. Everybody, it's, well. it's, 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 it's a great book. We will talk but, about but, the right moments. But later. he's easy. It's mm-hmm. easy to write evil characters. But Milton, so, Milton said that. Milton said Satan was easier to write than God. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, mm. absolutely. So this is my mother's recipe, and these are my mother's avocado dishes. Oh, they're the real. They're real from. They're the real ones. Oh, wow. The 1970s um, avocado prawn cocktail dish yes. that she brought round especially. So enjoy. Oh. But you haven't um, you haven't done the napkin in the real seventies way. <laughs> this is the real seventies napkin. This is one right? of his party tricks. Oh yeah. Oh, yes, the I, real I is like this. They might not be. And like this. Enough. No, they're fine. Mm-hmm. They're fine. <laughs> okay, madam. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? Oh, look at that. Now that, now that, that is, is a life skill, Richard. That is a 1970s right there in that a napkin. That is a life skill. I have to learn that. That's much prettier yes. than how I did them. <laughs> Thank you. Deb, I would actually love to ask you about your career trajectory. Were you writing when you were a child? Were you writing when you were a teenager? Were you putting on plays? Were you, you know, directing yes. other people in plays? I was, I used to write novels when I was 10 or 11. Mm. And when I was 11, 12, I said to my parents, I'm, I'd like to be a playwright, and so they gave me a typewriter. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's funny when you think about, when I look back on that now, I think, how many parents in Carlingford <laughs> in 1972 would have given their child... It's such um, an uh, investment in your yeah. Would have not laughed at me. Yeah, yeah. instead yeah. of saying, oh, don't be yeah. ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think starting young meant that I was naive enough that I just kind of did it. Mm. So I wrote plays, and I sent one off to John Bell in an envelope when I was 15. Yes. And so I went all through uni, I, I supported myself writing, I mean, waitressing. But, but also, you had, what, what did John Bell say? Good question. Well, nothing happened for six months, which was, you know, really good. What training. did you say in your letter to him? I said, dear Mr. Bell, I am 15. <laughs> I want to be a playwright. Can you tell me if this play is any good, if I have any talent or if I'm wasting my time completely? Fantastic, better. So I heard nothing for six months, which is training for life in the theatre mm. and and six months later he called me in and we had a little meeting that is wonderful and uh and then not long after that a play of mine was workshopped at a playwrights conference when i was 17. um child genius and and, <laughs> well, and and i sold that to abc radio so i made money as a professional writer when i was 17. Mm. and so i i wrote radio plays all through university which was you know in those days you could make you know not big money but you could support yourself writing radio mm. so I just never, I came out of university and went to film school. So how did you first meet each other? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to say that too. Well, I, 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 I was, um, uh, I, I was, I saw Deborah in the ANU refectory and I was attracted to her and then I saw her. Um, that I was she not was, attracted to him because he'd come back from London and he thought he was pretty hot stuff. He was marching around the ANU refectory as if, you know, he'd been living in London and we were all just very young. <laughs> and, and I remember thinking, look at that wanker. <laughs> and if you had told me that I would be with that wanker 38 years later. Mm. There we go. It's mm. a true love story. Mm. Mm. It's a fantastic moment. Just, you know, conflict, drama. Yeah. Oh, that's such a gorgeous story. Yeah. Mm. So, The 
the story I'm trying to tell in the book really is, is how attitudes we thought were immovable and locked in and were unable to be changed very recently have all been changed. Yes. So Australia has been entirely, entirely revolutionised in ways that are hard to imagine now until you really think about what it was like really quite recently. And to me, that gives you hope that a lot of the things that we think now are, uh, again, people say, oh, that's just normal. There's always going to be inequality. There's always going to be racism. There's always going to be, there's always going to be um, sexism. It, once you understand how far we've come, in a really quite short time, mm. it actually gives you hope for the ability of people to change. Yeah. So, Devas, can you say, what's your favourite? What's the favourite part of <clears> your book? <throat> oh, they're writing your book. Favourite um, oh, I don't know. I mean, I did love writing the the first love stuff. Mm -hmm. The the first sexual experience mm -hmm. scenes were were um, very enjoyable, but. I probably really like writing Sheena the most. Yeah. I mean, I have some of her impulses, and so mm. someone who's taking on the world in such a combative way, but with, with actually a very deep sense of honour. Mm. Have you ever wept while you... Oh, oh she Absolutely. weeps all the time. When I come home from work, she's often <laughs> marching up and down the, the corridor, absolutely in a character, mm. and she's sort of saying the lines of the character, and she's being Sheena or being yes. Gary or whoever, and she's weeping and yelling and... <laughs> And not always about, not always at him. Sometimes yes. about. No, she's wrestling her own. And because I. And she's practicing the sound of the person. Because you know. I'll probably, if I died tomorrow, my headstone would say that the woman who killed Patrick, which was the. the I the, know. Could you believe because, it? Because, because for people who don't know, I, I, I was the creator of Offspring and, and wrote the series where we killed the man that many women were in love with. Well, he was goddamn gorgeous. He was lovely. Mm. Um, and I'm. I'm still in witness protection, so you, you can't see them, but I have a security I detail when just it outside happened, there. And there was like these shock ripples oh, throughout yeah. popular culture. People and there was hated this, us. How could you? But when I when we were storylining that, um, so when I say we, I mean I mean me and the other um, two writers who wrote most of the episodes with me. Um, we wept talking about it because we felt so bad about what we were going to do to the other characters and to his unborn child. We felt very bad about it. Mm. I mean, the actor was needed to be released from his duties, so mm. he was going overseas. So you had to find some way. To we had to go. do something. So it was there was no sort of particular choice about it, and we felt terrible, and we knew it would be bad. We had no idea of the. I mean, people have described to me being on a train and seeing someone at the other end of the train carriage sobbing and going over and saying, Patrick, oh, and then going, bless. yes. And then, and one of my favorite things is the Ningen police put a thing on the, the official Ningen police Facebook page that said, we appreciate your phone calls, but we cannot, we cannot arrest anyone at Channel 10 for killing Patrick. Oh, no. <laughs> Which I really like. So I, but writing all that material, I would be, Sobbing. I cry too. Inconsolably. I'm no. sure you cry too, don't you? Oh, I'm like I'm not angry. so sure about you. Yeah. <laughs> I cried it. I cried. Well, I cried good things. I cried when Sheena rose up. It no, went... but you know, no. I cried good things. Kate's talking about when you're writing your own things. Yeah. Oh, no, I wouldn't cry then. I never quite understand it when people. I mean, and, and I respect this point of view when novelists say, I don't write for anyone, I just write for myself. And I think, well, I can't imagine doing what does that. Because that yeah. yeah. I'm always imagining, how will this, how, will this be clear? Yeah. Will this be moving? Will this be funny or whatever? Yeah, and, and, that, and that sense of pace, you, you know, have I got the person up until the next, you know, is, is it going to run? Are they going to turn the leaf over to the next page or the next yeah. chapter mm -hmm. or something yeah. like that? I can't imagine not worrying about that. No, I think is, no. that's part of the joy of writing in a way and, and to feel it yourself and going, well, I'm sure somebody else is going to feel well, this. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's all you can do. Yeah, so that's all we've me, got. I'm not writing into a void. I'm writing in order to reach out and connect with other humans. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm writing in order to, you know, connect and communicate. And um, I always feel when you know writers say that I'm only writing for myself. I think what they really mean is they're writing for their ideal reader, themselves, yeah. their state. Well, that's a reasonable ambition. I think. But, yeah, but, but to write right. for yourself is is is, is ridiculous. Like mm. you, 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 it's like it's like conversation. You wouldn't have a conversation with yourself. No. Well, I suppose we all do. But, <laughs> but and see, I I also believe that um, you know when we're writing, you know we're writing for someone. 
and we want them to bring their intelligence, their imagination, their life experience. The book is a greater thing with a reader than it would be yes. just with the writer. When I was about 11, I, I, my parents used to take me to the theatre and to the, what was the Nimrod Theatre then, which is now the Griffin, and where you would sit so close you could reach out and touch the actors. And I saw a production of The Tooth of Crime and Reg Livermore was in leather pants, mm -hmm. gyrating about. And at one point he spun around very fast and the sweat flew off his face and hit me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember that ever. And I thought... I thought that was an urban myth. And I thought... Being anointed by the sweat. This is fabulous. Mm. I want to do this. I want to be in this world. Mm. But I didn't want to be on the stage. I wanted to be the person who decided what they said. Mm. But it was just a sense of this incredible um, <laughs> life force happening in front of you um, and thinking, someone made this happen. Someone wrote mm. the words that made this thing happen in front of us now. Mm. And thinking, imagine being able to do that, to be part, or to, just to be part of that process. Did, did you ever have a moment like that, Richard? Yeah. Like, so, like, like an epiphany? Oh, so about no, I don't think so. No, not like that. No, oh. Rich Lynn was <laughs> sweating. That's marvellous. Yes. That's marvellous. Yes. <laughs> yes, well now we're at that time of the evening, as we are with every episode, when our author friends recommend their favourite books that they've read recently. So I think it'll be ladies first. Oh, so hello. I'll mm -hmm. hand the stage over right, to you, Deborah. I recently read An Odyssey by Daniel Mendelssohn. Um, Daniel Mendelssohn is, a, is an author and a classics academic. And this book is about um, when his 81-year-old father enrolled in, in the university course he taught on, Daniel taught on the Odyssey. And so the book is partly about the hilarious and moving experience of his 81-year-old of his father in his class. It's also a kind of unpacking of the Odyssey beautifully and lucidly. And it's also a memoir about his relationship with his father. And it's, he's a very humane, funny, brilliant author. Um, and it's full of the, the joy of teaching and the power mm, of teaching mm. and the power of, of the Odyssey itself. And it's, it's pretty spectacular. All mm. right, that's lovely. So how about you go next there, Ben? Oh, okay. All right. Well, um, this may sound a little bit... Uh, commercial, but the best book I've read race recently, because it's the only book I've read recently, is <laughs> Crazy Rich Asians. And I read, it may sound a bit commercial, but my husband is Singaporean Chinese, and this is set in um, Singapore. And I suppose a little bit like in the 19, when I came from England to Australia in the 1970s, it was like being transplanted like into a, 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 mm -hmm. on, on a new planet. And then when I met Colin, it was a little bit the same. He would, he would describe to me all these... Um, behaviors oh, that are very common and customs yeah. in Singapore so like for example the five C's you can only get married if you have a credit card cash um career condominium and a car so <laughs> have you Chanel yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 well, you could make it six Chanel as yeah. well if you can buy your wife Chanel so so <laughs> they're the six C's so I just I, I read this and it was such a a blast um, knowing, you know, particularly knowing the things that I do, and they've made it into a movie. So, yeah, fun, light, reading, and true. That's all I can right. say. Yeah. All right, so my, my pick of the month is called Song Lines, and it's called Tracking the Seven Sisters. And it's actually about um, the seven sisters myth and how it appears in different forms all through the um, indigenous mythology of, of the Australian um, Aborigines. So, the Seven Sisters myth is one of the most universal of all myths. It appears in all uh, human cultures. Um, and this book, I mean, it's beautifully, beautifully produced and has all sorts of maps and drawings. Can mm, you see? Mm. And it just shows how this one story, the story of, of the Seven Sisters, has um, you know, revealed itself in Australian art and legend. It's absolutely beautiful and it's quite humbling how beautiful it is mm. and, and also the fact that um, that you know, we humans share 
Yeah. It's such astonishing stories mm. all around the globe. Uh, mine's, mine's not uh, Joseph campbell or Mithy at all, although it's a great story. This is You Daughters of Freedom. It's the new history book by Claire Wright, who wrote that fantastic book about um, Eureka Stockade and all that. She's a great Australian historian. This is a story about how, how Australian women, well, people say New Zealand women uh, won the right to vote first, and that's true. But Australian women in South Australia won the right to vote and stand for election before anyone else in the world. And that, that bit then, when Australia federated, that then became the national thing. So Australia was really the first country that had full suffrage in that sense. And it's an amazing story and it talks about how those women then went on and talked to the world about it. And one of the stories I like best about how it worked in practice was one of the things right from the beginning was that if you give women the vote, um, they'll only vote for the handsome men. You don't really? understand that. Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Would yeah. Voted for well, you would have voted for you. Women being women, they'll only vote for the handsome men. There's a very, com <laughs> there's a very common view. And, and one of the men in the Australian, fe in the Australian yeah. Federal Parliament, one of the men in the Australian Federal Parliament, he's a, he's a guy called um, is it James Stewart. I've got, I've got oh, to look. It doesn't matter what his uh, name is. Okay, I've got, I've got to get the name right. James Stewart, okay, he's a Labor guy from Queensland, and he's, he's on the women's side. He's a suffragette, yeah. a, su a suffragist. I suppose. And he's speaking in the Australian Federal Parliament um, to try to support this idea that the women should get the vote. And of course, by this point, the women in South Australia and Western Australia have had the vote already. So mm. the people elected into the Federal Parliament in 1902 from those states have been partly elected by women. Mm. So he's in the perfect position to tell the world about the myth that they'll only vote mm. for handsome men. And he says, with great politeness, I hope that the bill will become law very speedily so that every man and woman on this continent will be invested with full political power. And, you know, and then he's, he comes to this issue and he says, look, the honourable senators returned from South Australia, we can see them. They do not number a single dude. This is 902, he says mm -hmm. dude. They do not number a single dude amongst them. All fine, big, rough, upstanding men. But they're not particularly handsome. Oh, <laughs> beautiful. Yes, I like it. It's rude. It's rude. <laughs> that is actually quite In the border sense of the word. Yeah, it's rude. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Deborah. Yes. What fun. Richard. Oh my god, we could fun. stay up till like dawn. Yeah. <laughs> and we could not stop talking. <laughs> no, I think we would die the next day. Can we can we impose that on It has been such a joy. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. And thank you all of you for joining us on Word of Mouth again. Have fun. Bye. Bye. See you next time. Thank you for joining us. And if you don't want to miss any of our shows, just press the subscribe button at the bottom of our YouTube channel. And if you want to know more about our fantastic giveaways or about any of our delicious recipes or book news, views and reviews then just go to our website at wordofmouthtv.com.au See you next time!